is not new to Richmond. It's not new to Southside. It's not new to Church Hill. It's not new to Northside. You know, it's very, it's ingrained in the very fabric of this country, right? So uh, earlier I said I, I was raised in, I was born in Richmond, raised in Richmond. So uh, I have a very vivid memory in watching the transformation of our city, right? Uh, I recall watching the removal or destruction of Blackwell, right? Uh, Blackwell housing projects was re removed in the late, you know, 90s, early 2000s. And so I had friends, family even, that lived in Blackwell, right? And so what we see today in terms of an area, you know, with the dialogue about whether this is Manchester, whether this is Blackwell, whether this is Swansboro, when I was growing up, it was Blackwell, right? And nobody wanted to live there because the housing projects and crime and all of these ideas of, that are rooted in the conversation around but non-neglect were a reality, right? And I think it's important for us to inspect like what the precedents were, what created these realities, um, and not only what created these realities, but what are some things that can be done or are being done to mitigate, remove, or even eliminate the dispossession of indigenous people in their communities in the city of Richmond. So today, I have assembled a motley crew <laughs> of uh, advocates, uh, community uh, representatives, uh, housing experts to really, you know, let's dig into this. Um, I'll use the word dialogue today in the truest of sense that this is not, you know, an academic exercise per se. This is a community conversation. You know, I've decided that, you know, we didn't want to have this to be super formal where, you know, we're the people up front with all the answers and the folks in the attendance are the ones that are here to get some information. No, there's a collective wisdom in the room. And as we move along in the dialogue, you know, I encourage conversation question. That's why we got wireless mics so that we can have some discourse about this conversation. So uh, I'm going to introduce the people on my panel today, uh, and then we're going to jump into it. I got a couple questions that I've uh, jotted down that they've been pre-notified uh, about, right? There's no surprises, right? Um, we're going to keep this um, as casual as possible. I wanted to have wine in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the gallery, but they said that was against the rules, so I, I, I promise y'all drinks. <laughs> It's probably for We need bourbon for the conversation. We need, the hard, we need some hard liquor for this conversation. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, to my left and to your right, um, I have Ryan Cozio, who is uh, with uh, Home. And where's the other mic? Brian, I'm going to let you introduce yourself. Well, I just, you know, I just tell a little bit, I'm, I'm going to pose a question for you and each person that's on the panel. Um, you can answer that as your introduction, right? Okay. So, you live in Richmond, presumably, right? Yep. Um, so, what is one of your fondest memories about living in the city of Richmond? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Brian Cozio. I've worked with Housing Opportunities Made Equal here in Richmond. Um, I've been in Richmond for about 15 years. I grew up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, you know, Richmond has given me a lot of a lot of good memories. Um, I was married here in a house in Battery Park. Um, both of my children were born while we lived there. Um, made a lot of really close friends. 
hopefully have done a lot of important work. Um, so yeah, maybe, you know, looking top and having children, getting married. Those are my fondest memories. All right, pass the mic. I've got to his right, or in my left, we got Jonathan Nopke of the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. And uh, no, before you, I give him a round of applause for Brian for showing up today. Uh, next up, I have Jonathan Nopke, who I met not only in, not in this context, you know, in another world life of uh, work around Urban Greening at Lewis Ginter, but he serves as a staff person or a staff member of the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. I'm curious. Same, same question, you know, what's your fondest memory of living in Richmond? Well, I'm not married and I have no kids, so uh, it's a tougher question for me, I think, but um, I am also a, a Richmond area native. I lived in the city for, I guess, about seven or eight years now. I'm a BCU grad, twice over undergrad and grad, so, um, I mean, I, I think the, my favorite memories in the city so far are being made now, which is, might be a cop-out, but I really think this is a great time to be in Richmond, the energy around these conversations and, and approaching issues of equity and really trying to make Richmond work for folks who it hasn't worked for for decades is really exciting. And I think being in this room and this energy um, will quickly become one of my favorite memories in the city. Nice. Yeah, give it up for Jonathan. Good afternoon, my name is Art Burton. I'm the Executive Director of Kinfolk Community and the Operations Director for a organization called Community Unity in Action, which is a uh, social leadership social justice round table where we work on pretty much all the social justice issues in the city. Um, I came to Richmond in 1970. My mother and father moved us to the Caroline, which was the first community in the city of Richmond that was being very intentional about black and white folks living together. Um, most people find that surprising because I spent a lot of time in public housing. My father came here as the associate director of the Richmond Urban League, and his portfolio was housing and economic development, and he spent a great deal of time organizing in public housing communities. Um, I wanted to make one correction. I am not a community advocate or a community representative. I am a political activist. Mm -hmm. That is my work. And my work is in the defense of black communities and black people. That is what I spend the majority of my time doing. And so um, it's a pleasure to be here along with you guys today. Nice, yeah, I give it up for our brother. Um, next, um, I've had the pleasure of spending the last six to eight months with this brother. Um, over the last uh, six to eight months, we've been uh, co-joined at the hip as, as uh, fellows for the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation and their uh, Health and Equity Fellowship. So it's uh, been a really amazing opportunity to learn a lot more about the work that you're doing. Um, but uh, Willie Hilliard, right? Yes, the man. So I wanted to give, give the people a little bit of uh, uh, a rundown. He's with the Brooklyn Park Area Association, right? Um, so for those that might not know who you are, give them a little bit of a background about what you do and what's one of your favorite uh, memories about living in Richmond. Thank you. Um, my name is Willie Hillier. Yo, this is hard for me. I don't like to talk about myself. Um, I'm a native Richmonder, native Northsider. Um, right now, I am the executive director of the historic Brooklyn Park Collective, formerly known as the Brooklyn Park Area Association, which um, I am a business owner on Brooklyn Park Boulevard. Uh, I guess the fondest memories of Richmond, for me, I'm still formulating. Um, growing up in Richmond in the 60s and 70s, 
I'm gonna tell you like this. As, as, as an 18 year old, I hated Richmond. Mm -hmm. Richmond didn't have the opportunities for a black person in this city. Um, my mother was a Black Panther. I remember the Black Panther Party. She was ran out of Richmond in the early 60s. Um, I would say that the Richmond that I see today, I love. Um, I just wish she was here to see it. Uh, she's no longer with us. That she can see the changes in the Richmond that's made. And there's been a lot of positive changes. But there is so much more that needs to be done in the city. And I think with the right-minded collection of people like Ron and the panel and yourselves, we can really make this city what we want it to be. And I love Richmond. Give it up for Willie Hill. And certainly not last, certainly not least, but the last introduction is another amazing soul spirit, uh, Shekinah Mitchell of Virginia Lisk, who I also had the pleasure and honor of sharing space with for the last, you know, six to eight months with uh, the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation as a health and equity fellow. Um, give the people a little bit of the background of yourself and what is one of your fondest memories as a, as a Richmonder. Hi, everybody. I also just want to give a shout out to Lissette. She's the other health and equity fellow who is here. It's like a big reunion. Yes. And we are looking for a consultant around issues around diversity and inclusion. Holla at Lissette. So um, uh, it's tough to pick just one memory. So I am from the East End. I'm from Churchill. Um, I guess one of my favorite moments is that my parents bought their first home, and they have crazy stories. Um, both grew up in public housing, my dad ended up in foster care. So it was a really, really big deal when they were able to have their first home. It's on Mosby Street. And they moved there when I was around eight years old. And uh, my dad was so excited, he literally slept on the front porch the night before they got the keys. Um, it was a big deal because it meant that all of his brothers and sisters had a place to go for Christmas and Thanksgiving. Like The small things that we take advantage of, this house like represented all of that for his whole family. Um, so that was, that was a fun memory, getting my own room for the first time. But another one has nothing to do with housing. Um, it's kind of a hood story. So um, I have my favorite corner store. And I used to go there all the time. Cheech was the guy who owned it. He knew exactly how to make my cheeseburger. And I was walking out one day, and there was this fine man. And he was like, how you doing, young lady? And I was like, I'm fine, I'm fine. What's your name? We talked and talked and talked. And he asked me for my phone number. And at the time, he thought I was lying, but I actually had lost my phone. Um, but I was like, I'll give you my number, and if you can reach me, then I guess it's meant to be, but if not, then oh well. And um, we'll be celebrating our 10 year wedding anniversary. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's magnificent. Thank you for sharing. I'll uh, give it up for Shekinah. Thank y'all. So, um, you know, I'm gonna, I'll start this off by telling a story. So, I lived, I grew up in Southside. You know, I was raised off Hopkins Road, right? Um, which I just found out maybe like a year ago was called Dearborn. I had no clue that that was the name of the neighborhood. Go figure. Um, but I now live in Northside. So, um, I live in a house that is third generation. My fiance, uh, her grandparents bought the house and uh, the 1950s, they moved into Northside from Church Hill. Um, for those who are not familiar, you know, people of color have been uh, migratory around the city of Richmond, you know, since its inception, right? We hear stories about Jackson Ward, we hear stories about Barton Heights, we hear stories about East Richmond and Church Hill. Um, but the narratives of people of color in the city, 
you know, correspond with some of our uh, the same the same stories about desegregation and uh, white flight and massive resistance. Like people have moved around the city as a result. Um, you know, we talk about redlining and things like that. We can get into that a little later. Uh, but this story struck me because um, you know what happened was is that. Northside is experiencing an acceleration of, or an increase in property value, right? So uh, after my uh, fiance's grandparents passed away, they left the house to my fiance's mother, who you know lived on a fixed income. You know she's on a disability, right? And so as the property values increased, we live in a house that's oil-based heat, right? So. You know, it becomes a, a becomes a question as do I pay my taxes or do I live in a cold house in the winter of time, right? So it kind of quickly got out of control. So me and my fiance said, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to come in and we're going to take over the mortgage, right, of the house. And so I met um, uh, my uh, aunt-in-law, and she recounted this story about how when she was young in her um, preteens in the 1950s, latter part of the 1950s, that this family, the Marshes, were one of the first families to move into Northside, right? And she said something that just blew my mind was that, you know, someone had burned a cross in their front yard on the corner of uh, North Avenue in Meredith. Right? We probably pass up and down that street every day. But in the 1950s, someone was burning a cross on her front yard as being one of the first African American families to move into Northside. Right? And so I say this to contextualize, you know, this week, I know a lot of us are exhausted by, you know, what's going on with the government in terms of Northam and, you know, herring and all this different type of stuff. But, you know, our grandparents, lived under threat of clan activity, right? So that's my mother's generation, my grandparents, right? So it's not too far along ago where someone was afraid of their safety as a result of a clan hood. And in the context of blackface, I think it's important for us to be aware of where this stuff comes from, that this is about racial tyranny. And in that moment, you know, someone was trying to scare this family from living in a particular neighborhood, right? Fast forward 30 years later, 40, 50 years later, now this area is the hot spot, you know? And the folks that have lived there for the last 20 years, 20, 30 years, are now being pushed out. So I just want to center the conversation in that context, right? That when we talk about race and place, you know, we're not talking in a, we're not decontextualizing, you know, these realities. We're not ahistorical in our analysis of what's going on. Um, and that we're very clear that, you know, contemporary realities are colored by what came before the predecessors. All right? So um, I had give y'all a couple questions. So this is going to be easy, uh, just to kind of break the ice. Um, we have some diversity in this panel, right, or this conversation. Uh, I want to hear from y'all, what, from your vantage point, does gentrification look like from your vantage point, from your uh, point of view as a resident of Richmond, as a person who works you know, particularly in the realm of housing, who works with, whether it be nonprofit or community, who works in the community, uh, who lives in the society, what does gentrification look like to you in Richmond? Uh, thank you. You know, when I got the invitation to do this event, I started not to come here because I said I wasn't going to have a conversation about gentrification no affordable housing. Um, and I have intentionally stayed out of those conversations um, because I, I just uh, have, have 
I get a little disconcerted when we, it seems like all the conversations that we have, we have in a way to keep white folks comfortable. And we have a couple people who are allowed to have those conversations. And we tend not to talk about the elephant that's in the room, and that's the elephant of race, you know. It amazes me now when I, you know, because now all of the black communities, everyone who lives in it has trauma, okay? And, you know, the trauma that we have, they need trauma-informed care because they have trauma. But no one ever talks about the fact that the trauma has been caused by racism. They just left that out. Um, and so I wanted to be careful when I came here today you know, to make, I want to correct one thing. Um, in 1929, 92% of the pe black people in the city of Richmond lived in Jacksonville. Okay? And white people decided, white power structure decided that they were unsightly. It didn't look good for the city to have that many black people in its central core, and they needed to be moved. And over the next 40 years, they set about destroying those communities and moving black people all around the city. You know, we won't have conversations about eviction, gentrification, affordable housing. There is no such thing in this city as affordable housing for poor black people, okay? Anybody who wants to get tell you about affordable housing, you should tell them that's not a conversation in the context of poor black people or working class black people. There's just simply no such thing. Um, and we really need to, and I'm going to stop here by saying if we're going to have the conversations, we really need to have real conversations because everybody in this city knows what was done to create the racist system that we live in. And either we're going to undo what we did or we're going to live with it. But we shouldn't continue to walk around and not act like we don't know what was done. Thank you. You know, I think to me, gentrification in, in Richmond just looks like, at, you know, the history of this nation repeating itself at the local level. All right. So, um, I look at a lot of data um, and make maps and, and stuff and talk about them. Um, and the, you know, if we look at the last. 15 years, right, the, the economic crisis, foreclosure epidemic um, in 07 and 08, right, we know that was that was caused, right, that was created to, it was, it was a part of, of white wealth creation, right, they knew that we could spin these loans off um, and, and people could make a lot of money, we know that that black and brown neighborhoods were targeted for, for these loans, right. So if you take that, where subprime loans were made, and then the resulting foreclosures, and then you look at current mortgage lending data and put it all together, that's what exactly what gentrification looks like um, in, in the city. And um, God, this was years ago. I was um, at an event sort of like this, and somebody was talking about so it's, you know, 2007, 2008, 2009, when, you know, African-American neighborhoods accounted for well over half of all of the foreclosures in the region. Um, I heard it referred to as a, as a modern day land grab. Um, and it is, it was, right? And whether it was like orchestrated behind closed doors with, you know, the, I don't know, these mythical, you know, powers of, you know, of the business community, um, I don't know, but the result is the same, right? It took wealth and land from brown and black families. Um, and so that's what we have to, that's what we have to stop doing. But you got it. You, you got it. You know, during the Obama administration, 50% of the wealth of black communities was taken back from it. 
okay, through these subprime loans. It, it absolutely was intentional. And even today, after he bailed out the banks and gave them all of that money, um, if you look today, most black people are still locked out of being able to borrow money to own a home, okay? The credit score of 700 means that most black people in this city simply don't qualify. So effectively, not only was all of, you know, there is no white president who could have done what Obama, Barack Obama did, which was steal all the black people's money and give it away to white folks and then take their homes and then lock them out of the market and keep us locked out of the market while the city is literally being taken away, taken over by uh, affluent middle class people. And that, I mean, I just want to make sure we're clear about that this was intentional and, it, and the results are still affecting black people's ability to not only own homes, but create a self-sustaining economy for themselves. Uh, everybody that has spoken so far has been much more eloquent than I can be about all those points. So um, I, I just want to mention that I've had the uh, privilege of teaching an intro to urban planning class, uh, an undergraduate class here at BCU, and one of the topics that comes up over and over again is gentrification. And I see some of these students really, I think, struggle, but in, in a good way, with talking about what it is and what it means and how to process it. And I'm by no means the best person to help explain that to them. Um, but one thing that I have found helpful, helpful is to think of it, as she kind of mentioned, as a true process. I, I am like Brian, I'm a data guy. I like to analyze things and analyze maps. And so when something is a process, there is a precondition, then there is action, and then there is a post condition, right? There's you know, pre something happening and then post. And so you know, I've had students say, you know, well, Carytown is gentrified, right? And I'm like, no, not quite. You know, we have to think about what what are, what were the existing conditions that have to be there before you know gentrification can take place. And I think that's a really interesting conversation. And then there's the process itself, right? Which I I think wealth extraction and manipulation is a huge part of it as well. So I think that's a big part of the process. Um, and then an almost entirely different conversation is what is the end result of that and what is that post condition that happens in these neighborhoods and is that post t period of time how stable is that does the does the neighborhood cycle again I think we've seen as Duran has alluded to changes in neighborhoods um, especially in Richmond dating back hundreds of years have happened over and over again um, you know because of racism because of intentional efforts to move people out um, for nefarious reasons, and so um, I think it's really important to to frame gentrification, at least for me, to help understand it as a true, you know, iterative process that is is driven, um, you know, by racism, by the the desire to extract wealth from certain areas. Um, but there's tons of just huge macro level things that go into it, and micro level conditions that are are the result of it. So. Um, that's the way I think of it, and so this conversation is, I think, beginning to really help me as well understand that process aspect of it. Um, I don't like the word gentrification. I don't like the term affordable housing as well. We'll get into that later. For me, gentrification is intentional, cyclical racism. And I say it's cyclical for this reason. Um, as I stated before, my mother was ran out of the city. I went to live with my grandmother in 1968 in a neighborhood known as Providence Park in Northside, which is walking distance from the Richmond Raceway. When I moved over there, our community probably was 40% white, um, and it wasn't a good thing. I mean, they were our neighbors. Probably a few years later, in the early 70s, everybody moved out. The white flight took, and they left. They left our cities and our communities in a bad shape. Um, and a lot of people were able to 
move into these homes, but they couldn't sustain them because there still were no real job opportunities for blacks in the city. Um, no real assistance was given. And then the drug epidemic came. And that really destroyed our communities, leaving most of these homes to be shells because the people that lived in them couldn't sustain them. Um, so now we see here in the last, and I'm just speaking on North Side, probably in the last seven to eight years, the white community has come back. And the reason is because these are the cheapest homes in the, in the city that they can buy. And they come in with their ideas of community. And they're not the same ideas of community that the residents that are already there have. So there's this clash of culture because the new residents see community and see life and living in a different way than those who've been there 30, 40 years. So there's a strong clash in the community for control of the culture. Um, Probably, I guess 10, 15 years ago when Hurricane Gaston came through the city and it destroyed Battery Park, for anybody that knows Battery Park, it destroyed Battery Park. That was the first influx of white flight back into the city. And from my personal recollection, those first families that came into the community were not welcoming. They wanted things their way, you know, and they thought that we should conform to what they wanted. And the black people in our community said, no, because we've been here forever, you're not gonna tell us what we're gonna do, because we're not going anywhere. I will say that the recent flight of the last five years has gotten better. The millennials, I would say, are a lot more open to being you know, better neighbors and better community and trying to figure out how we can all sustain and get along together. Um, but it's a lot of work. And a lot of these developers are coming in now and they only see the dollars. So a lot of our residents who I deal with, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that at least 30 or 40 black families within Northside are getting phone calls about selling their homes. You know, it's getting to the point now that they have got going past buying vacant homes, and I'm just gonna buy you out your home. You know, with no care as to where you're going. So gentrification for me is, is a fight that I'm in, and I'm fully prepared for it. Um, and we're just gonna make it work. You know, it, 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 it sounds bad, and it is, but you know, out of every darkness comes some light, and we're gonna find a light within this. So, um, I'm a, I'm a, we're in the process of naming the problem, right? You know, um, so I'm gonna do a little historical context because it's been alluded to, but I don't think anybody has pointed out to it directly. So, uh, Dr. John Meeser from University of Richmond has done an explicit, exquisite amount of research on uh, redlining in the city of Richmond. And the way the story goes is that in the 1950s, you know, the Federal Housing Administration uh, went about the business of going throughout the country to try to create wealth through financing in, uh, of, of home ownership in communities across the country. So there was an organization developed called the Home Owners Loan Cor Corporation that went in and assessed the values of neighborhoods across the country. Richmond was no exception. And uh, the, the way these assessments went is that they graded neighborhoods based on the quality of you know the homes or the demographics. And in Richmond, um, you know, the, 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 the term redlining comes from these assessors literally taking red marker and painting entire neighborhoods in red, right? And those neighborhoods being African American or uh, uh, black or brown communities uh, with no other uh, criterion other than they were places where people of color lived, right? Uh, so you would take an example of a, of a neighborhood like Jackson Ward, which was predominantly black at the time, 
uh, the quality of that neighborhood is amazing, right? These are historic homes. Some of the most unique ironwork in the country exists in the homes along Play Street, right? Uh, these are amazingly built spaces. Uh, but, you know, the assessors said that because there were African Americans that lived in this neighborhood, that they would get a failing grade, right? And as a result, were ineligible for mortgages and financing from the federal government, right? To the uh, exception of all of their white counterparts that were able to acquire these financing. So for an entire government program to basically discriminate, from, or to discriminate against African American communities in such a way created an intense disparity in one of the most uh, clear methods of wealth building in this country, which is home ownership, right? So if we say that, and this, for, for us to say that this happened in tandem with what uh, uh, Art spoke about in the relationship of the creation of Highway 95, which decimated the, or bisected Jackson Ward, removing thousands of homeowners from that area in order to create the highway to, you know, the antithesis of the Richmond community that did not want the highway to go through the city, right? Um, and then we had the third layer of disinvestment by uh, families of white ancestry, European ancestry, who decided that because of the desegregation of public schools, that folks did not want to live in close proximity and that they would participate in white flight and mass resistance. So this is the historical context that we find ourselves when we fast forward 60 years later, and we identify those same neighborhoods that were redlined. These are the areas that are, you know, what are termed neighborhoods in transition, right? And these are the same neighborhoods that black and brown communities are being pushed out from, right? So I just want to put that inside of the room because I think it's important for people to, you know, acknowledge or at least be in a clear understanding of, you know, what we're seeing today didn't just happen. Right, and that there were specific uh, policies that were put in place. There were specific efforts that came about that crippled neighborhoods that created a reality where people couldn't afford, right, to uh, rehab homes, purchase homes. You know, there was a wealth disparity that was created by these realities. Right? You want to share? And I want to be careful not to relegate this to a historical moment or a moment done by just the government because when I decided to come here, I did want, I didn't want to just come here and say it's just racism, y'all. <laughs> um, and so I decided I would look up the definition of gentrification. And under number two, it said it is a, an intentional violent act created and, pre uh, and perpetrated by powerful corporate interests, okay? And that's what gentrification is. It is a violent act, or as my sister would say, it is economic violence, okay? It's a, and, and, that, and that's what's going on. So, so I'm, I've lived in Richmond 50 years, even though I'm only 42. Um, <laughs> And I've lived in every community, Jackson Ward. I've always followed gentr gentrification follows me, okay? <laughs> because my work as an activist means I work in communities that have been intentionally isolated, intentionally marginalized, marginalized, intentionally left without police folks. And so when, when they get so violent and so out of control, then people say, well, we better give him a job. <laughs> And they call me in and to try to help change these communities. And so I'm always one step ahead of gentrification in Jackson Ward, Highland Park, and now Church Hill. Um, I went to Jackson Ward in 1980. And, and this is, I want to, this is something you guys can do to help stop gentrification, or at least be aware of it, because the corporate and the development class of the city of Richmond have always used the creative and artistic class of VCU and its students as the precursors of gentrification. 
So they always move young, white, creative, and artistic people into black communities first because they figure you guys can live with us, okay? <laughs> that y'all are so creative and crazy, y'all will figure out a way to live with us, okay? <laughs> All right? And then after they leave you there about five or six or seven years, they come in and they buy up everything, and then they move you guys to the next community where they can do it all over again. And that's been the history of this city, in Jackson Ward, Highland Park, and now in Church Hill. And the restaurant that is now the Gar Bar was put in in 1980 by a professor here, art professor, Kim Weinberger, Dick Blosser, a realtor, Cortland Spots, Billy LeBrow, with the intention of creating a hub for white people to act off of and move inside of Jackson Ward. That was what it was put there for. And I know because I was the first manager of that restaurant. And that was, that, so I'm not, that was their intention. And so the community decided they, they would just rob them three times and get them out, okay? Which they did, and we parted there for 20 years until, until Garbar came. And, but they planted the seed for gentrification of Jackson Ward, and that was the intent. And that, was, that is always the intent of these corporate class. We see it in Blackwell now with the hills. You know, everybody knew gentrification was occurring, but nobody believed it was occurring on the scale that it was occurring where one family was buying up 76 property, 76 buildings backed by 250 million dollars. It was like, God damn. <laughs> this is different. This used to be like little sets of white people, you know, running in at the same time, not a few of them off, but this is different, you know? And so I just want to be clear about that, that what was done historically is still is now being done intentionally and is happening on an unprecedented scale in this city at a time when black people cannot possibly amass enough money to push back against it. Well, we just get, you know, $250 million a week. There is nowhere we can go and get that kind of money, okay? So I just want to be clear, but you guys can recognize what is occurring as you move into these communities. And if you understand how you're being used to aid and abet that, then maybe we can start having some different conversations about how we build and transform communities organically. So um, I'm gonna throw the second question out because we spent a few minutes on this. Uh, I wanna get to at least three to four questions that I polled. <laughs> Um, so, so. <laughs> I, I don't get to do this much. Also. Hey, look, our, I'm so glad you're here. Look, seriously. Um, so, Brian, yeah. um, you know, you're my resident numbers guy, right? Um, so I'm going to ask you this question, and anyone can chime in, but I know you know or you're familiar with it because I've been in the room with you for a couple of these presentations. Um, where are we seeing the trends in terms of displacement? in the city of Richmond, and what has been, or what are some of the most alarming trends in terms of neighborhood transition demographically that you can, you know, uh, speak to in, 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 a few, in a few moments that we have today? Sure, so <clears throat> looking at um, just like demographic data, population data, right? You can look at um, changes over time, relatively easily. Um, did a, a thing in conjunction with the Valentine um, a couple of years back in which I, I did, actually did that, right? Um, at a pretty detailed level. Um, Manchester, and like we got into this whole thing about the proper, the, the names of neighborhoods and the city has definitions of neighborhoods that differ from what residents think of as their neighborhoods. Um, so I, I don't want to go down that path, but generally, like Manchester, the, that like warehouse industrial area that got completely redeveloped um, in 2000, the U.S. Census Bureau found one person living there. Right? If y'all know who that was, <laughs> I'd, I'd love to talk to them. Um, they probably got displaced. They probably, yeah, they're probably long gone. Um, and then 10 years later, right, and that development really started in like 
06, 07, right? Um, 700 and some odd votes, right? Um, <clears throat> Church Hill has been, you know, you can see if you map year over year over year, you can see, and let's just say on your map, you know, blue dots are, are white people, you see like this blue cluster expand. Um, Blackwell, um, Oak Grove, those areas, um, definitely along Sims Avenue. Um, and then like the Broken Park neighborhood recently. And that's been, I think, probably the most intense um, you know, that's been since really, I don't know, it was like 08, 09, right when, yeah, you know, I mean, there were some a, a little bit before, but it really took off like starting 2010, I think that, and that's, we're nine years out and that neighborhood is completely, a, a completely different neighborhood um, than, you know, when even when I lived there in, you know, 2005, so. Um, those are kind of the three areas. I think um, Scott's Edition is kind of unique because it was this, um, it's, you know, and that's not really displacement that I know of. It's a whole different thing, right? It's like the conversion of warehouses into loft apartments. Right. It's, it's a right. different type of house. Well, yeah. some folks will speak to what effects it's having on Carver. You know, I mean, uh, yeah. at, uh, you know, closer right. to the city, uh, and that there were people there, but you know, it was kind of like on the margins, but right. they're getting pushed out yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, anybody else want to chime in on that? I just wanted to make sure to put that in. I feel like I'm from the seat. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not like a data expert, uh, but. Because I'm from Churchill, I was just like, what is happening in my neighborhood? And wanted, um, could talk about it qualitatively, like, um, could say, okay, Churchill is considered a food desert, but there are restaurants here now with like $50 a plate. How is that happening in the same space? Um, but wanted to have some data and information, but specifically around the race piece. I looked at some census data, and I'll just read this brief paragraph. It says, in my neighborhood, this racialized wave of gentrification is moving from south to north. So again, this is Churchill. According to census data comparing 2010 and 2016, and let me pause. So I'm gonna use terms like east end south and east end north. I use Nine Mile Road as a barrier. So essentially the census tracts that are south of Nine Mile Road versus the ones that are north of Nine Mile Road. Y'all with me? Thumbs up? Cool. East and south, saw the number of white people increase by 44%, which is two and a half times the rate of growth in the black population. In addition, while blacks comprised the largest racial ethnic group in East and South in 2010, by 2016, whites were in the majority. While East and South saw a significant shift in racial demographics, East and North saw no changes in racial demographics greater than 2%. So again, if you think about how this is happening, I mean, even using the word wave, it's like block by block moving forward. There's a whole section of the neighborhood that still looks like Churchill from the 90s, but then there's this whole other section that is rapidly changing and it's definitely racialized. Yeah, so I, the, the wave is definitely a thing. So if you map, um, home transactions or home sales in Church Hill um, annually over time going back five, six years or so. So start right after the recession when activity really started picking up. Um, you could, if you kind of interpolate the area of the block set of homes that are going for over $200,000, you know, 10 years ago, that was really just in the core, you know, historic designated area of Church Hill around St. John's Church. And slowly but surely, about every year, that 
air, that blob of homes that are going for well over $200,000 is moving up by at least one block a year. And recently it's been jumping two to three blocks and now it's all the way up by you know, M Street or so and, and continuing to march forward. And if we look at the census data, I don't have the exact figures, but the net loss of black homeowners in Churchill, um, even since 2010, is in the hundreds. And so it's, it's the scale at which this is happening um, there is, is really remarkable. Um, but yeah, I think, I think it's interesting to, to look at Church Hill and then also think about Manchester and Scott's addition. And I, I want to make one thing that I really want to make clear for people in the audience who are still kind of teasing gentrification and this is idea and just trying to figure out how to talk about it. You know, what we're talking about here today is very, very different than what's happening, you know, in Manchester and Scott's edition, because again, you have to look at the preconditions, who was there beforehand, and what are the policy mechanisms and policy choices that are leading to these rapid shifts in neighborhoods. And I think it's almost disingenuous to say that Scott's edition is gentrifying or Manchester, the core Manchester industrial area is gentrifying. I think we need some very different words to describe what's happening in these two different types of, of neighborhoods. Um, yeah, I, I would agree it's a little different in Scott's edition because um, it was a warehouse space. Uh, but you also have to understand this as a political attack as well. Um, when my father and the men and women in the early 70s helped create this government, because this is a new government, um, it was based on the idea that black people would be represented politically by controlling certain districts, that by being represented in certain districts where they had majority control, and that majority of control was based on where black people lived. And at the time, the corporate community, even in the 70s, you know, they fought from 70 to 77 before they were finally forced to relinquish the political control of this city. And even then, the commitment was that they did not want black people to run the city of Richmond. And, you know, and, and really didn't think we were capable of running the city of Richmond. And so when you look at what's going on with the housing in certain Manchester, you know, and when I ran for public office in 19, 1997 in Highland Park, um, Saad el said to me, you know, the sixth district is the only district in the city of Richmond where a black person can speak unapologetically for black people and not have to worry about political repercussion. Because no white people lived in the sixth district. But Manchester is in all of those white folks who have moved in the sixth district. Now you would use it. The last election, Councilwoman Ellen Robinson had a 29-year-old white guy run against her, and she only won, I think it was 600 votes. Wow. Yeah. Yes, that's the change system, unprecedented. We, you may not even have black representation by the next election, okay? That's why the conversation about Parker Agilesto is so critical to this city because essentially he is taking us back to when we were represented by white men all from the first district. That's where we are. I mean, it is, it is really scary for those of us who have given our lives to this idea that there would be this black political leadership and this black economic uh, agenda uh, to be looking at today where uh, we're, we may be faced with no black political representation and literally no money is, uh, is, is and are being forced out of the city completely is uh, kind of scary. All right, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's a great context. So listen, um, we've named the problem. I think we've, you know, we did the MRI, x-ray, you know, CAT scan, we got a good understanding of what the problem is. Um, so now let's talk about, you know, what we can do to excise this thing, right? What's the, what's the recommendation for surgery? Like, what's the prognosis? Um, I brought each one of you all up here today because from my vantage point, I consider you all not to just be the folks that 
still in the problem. I consider y'all to be solutionaries as well, right? Can we? Yeah, I, I think, yeah, there's a consensus. Yeah, if I get a tag, I'm, I'm gonna market that. Um, <laughs> Um, so what are some efforts in place or strategies that you can identify that you feel can help mitigate, slow down, or cease the dispossession and displacement of communities of color in the city of Richmond? That's a big, that's a big question. And you just, you know, you spark That's right. So, so I'm working on three projects right now. Um, so we're, we're pushing back, because we, we started pushing back. Um, on Brooklyn Park Boulevard, I'm partnered with Lamar Dixon on the bank building, and we just recently uh, signed a MOU with Virginia Union University to put a small business development center there, uh, which we intend to use to bring interns through to support the existing black businesses on Brooklyn Park Boulevard to ensure that they have space and actually create more black entrepreneurs in the city and more black developers in the city. Um, so I'm really excited about, and, and for the first time in 20 years, the Virginia Union may even have a short-term presence on Broad Street, but it will eventually be the, the, the small business center that will be eventually housed on Brooklyn Park Boulevard. Um, and I, in the East End, I'm working on the Food Justice Corridor, and that's in the, uh, the entire part of the East End. Um, and, you know, I, I defend public housing. You know, we talk about eviction and affordable housing, but the housing of last resort is under attack in this city. And, you know, I met with the prospective uh, CEO of the housing, the new one that's coming in, and there is still a commitment to destroy public housing in this city. And I think we really need to address that. But we, we're pushing against that. We're going to fight for the opportunity to transform public housing. Uh, and so those are, those are the, the two, I think, the two. And, and then the last thing is we need workforce housing. There are models of homes that we can build for around $100,000 to $120,000. Uh, we did a project with Ryan Wren at Storefront for the Mosby Court community, where uh, Bert Pinnock, who is one of the black, leading black architects in the city, has a model of home. We brought the mob kids over to help us reimagine re Mosby Court. We call it Howard's World. And what we found is as they started working on the project, they figured out that they would like to live somewhere like we were creating for working class black people because they wanted the opportunity to live somewhere where they could own a home, pay their water, lights, gas bill for about $1,200 a month. And so we, are, we, we have plans to build communities where people can buy homes for about $100,000 and $140,000 a year. We don't have that in this city. And so we need public housing, workforce housing, affordable housing. True. Well, I don't care what they do with it after they put the workforce in. They want to, I mean, you know, I, mean, I can't buy money in no way. So, I mean, but that's what we need. That's what we propose as some of the solutions. Um, I will speak to Brooklyn Park. <sighs> Brooklyn Park was created in the 1890s as a streetcar suburb by James Barton. And during that time, Louis Ginter was building his, sub, his uh, community at the same time. Brooklyn Park was built as a low-income community around the streetcar suburb, and that would allowed the first original inhabitants of that community to move in. Um, once 95, I 95 tore up Jackson Ward, a lot of more affluent black families moved towards the outside because they could afford those homes. And a lot of those families of second and third generations are still there. Um, struggling. A lot of people have said that Brooklyn Park will be the next Cary Town or the next Scott's edition. And every time they say that, I cringe. And I tell them it's never going to happen. Never. 
Currytown is a community, and so is Brooklyn Park, and they are completely different. Um, the black people in our community can't afford to pick up the lead. So needless to say, they're not going anywhere. Um, since I've been with the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation, I recently started a nonprofit called Ascend RBA. A-S-E-N-D, R-B-A, and it stands for Advocate for Steadfast, Collaborative, Eradication of Neighborhood Displacement. I know it's a lot. Um, and basically what we're doing is trying to tackle this gentrification in a threefold um, fight, one being policy advocacy. And we're pushing at the state Senate level to enact some laws, one being inclusionary zoning, which we want to make that a law of land, which means that these developers who, why I don't like the word affordable housing, because these developers have learned the language of affordable housing, and they know how to use it to take advantage and get the benefits that we don't know or can't use. So we want to we want to um, make community benefits agreements, the law of land, saying basically that if developers come into our community, you meet with the community, and we lay out uh, a joint vision of what we want our community to see, and we make that an agreement on paper that you won't price us out, and you will put in amenities and the green spaces that this community needs. Brooklyn Park does not have a grocery store. They're lacking green spaces. And even with the recent flight that we have now, white people within this community, we still don't have any services. Brooklyn Park still has crime. We have trash. We have graffiti that the city still looks at us, and they look at our tax roll. And they say, there's no money coming off of Brooklyn Park. So, we don't concern that with them. So again, we're still dealing with those same issues. So we're, we're trying to come with it and, and again, make it legal and make it, you know, and make it, make it the law of the land so that if you can come into our community and do this work, then we want to be right there with you to say, this is what we want to see, this is how we want to go. So it's a lot to do, but we're in this fight. So, um, I'll, one of the things that I learned is, um, and part of the issues I think with even using the term affordable housing, is that there's, there's like a, a spectrum, and it's based on the area median income. And for Richmond, the area median income includes the city of Richmond, Chesterfield, and Rico, Hanover, like it's a large area. And so for a family of four in Richmond, actually I think, 100% of the area median income right now is around $82,000 a year. So in order to be considered affordable housing, you could be earning 8% of the AMA, of the AMI, and so 80% of 82,000 is still a lot of money, right? If you think about a person who is working 52 weeks a year, earning minimum wage, and where they fall on that spectrum, they're closer to the 10%, 15, maybe 20% of the area median income. Now the other piece I want to add to that is when you look at the affordable housing sector, right? So who are the organizations providing affordable housing? The majority of them are serving folks who may be as low as 60% of the area median income all the way through 120% of the area median income. There are a couple of exceptions that will, like Habitat for Humanity, that'll go lower, maybe around 50%, or 47, or 48. Um, sometimes Better Housing Coalition will have rental properties, certainly for, for ex excluding seniors, um, but that'll go as low as 50%. But there's a significant gap between people at that 50% mark and below. Public housing, are y'all following me? That's what yeah. you're following. Conversation sounds like. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important to understand, right? So that you can know when someone is saying affordable housing, we're still talking about people earning 40, 50, 60, 70 thousand dollars a year, right? For public housing, typically that falls around 30% of their median income or below. So there's a significant gap. When we talk about workforce housing, when we talk about being affordable to people who are not making 
who, who may not be college educated, who, again, are not making 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90,000 dollars a year, it's a significant gap in who's serving that population. So I think one of the strategies is that we have to figure out how to close that gap and to be vigilant and intentional about closing that gap so that folks can actually have housing and home that is affordable. I think it includes preservation, but it also includes development as well. Um, gentrification is not just physical displacement, it's cultural displacement, right? So, hey, Mariah, I just had to say hi. Sorry, y'all, that's my church here coming out. Okay, so cultural displacement, um, we, in the same way that we are being, that we have to be vigilant about preserving and creating housing that is affordable for all of the people in our community, we have to do the same with culture. That means celebrating the stories of Jackson Moore. Like, I graduated from RPS, and it wasn't until I was working for VCU that I really learned about Jackson Moore. That's unacceptable, right? There's a story of, of Churchill, there's a story of Blackwell, and beyond murals, I mean, whether it is murals or festivals or statues, right? Like, we have to figure out how do we establish a cultural identity and celebrate those things in communities so that when people start feeling deprived of their sense of belonging, like do I belong here anymore? The stores that I used to go to, the store that I met my husband doesn't, in doesn't exist anymore, right? Like is this still my neighborhood? We have to figure that out. And the third is that it's economic displacement. And so we have to find ways, I mean, similar to what I was saying, we have to find ways to support um, development, encouraging black developers, providing access to resources. Um, so I think we need a three-pronged approach. There's physical displacement, there's cultural displacement, and there's economic displacement all through gentrification. And we need to have strategies in all of those areas to help preserve our communities. I, I totally agree. Um, the one thing, well, there are a couple of things I think that um, economic equity, inequality, right, is that if we look at all of that data, economic inequality is perpetuated by corporations, right, along gender and, and race lines, right, time and time again, right? Um, until we can address that, until our business community can address that, um, we're not going to get very far into getting people into wealth building opportunities in ownership of land, which has been historically denied um, to brown and black people in this country, right? So, equal pay. And that's going to take gender, you know, that's, when you look, I've, I've read something um, recently that had to do with the amount of wealth owned by, um, the, the amount of wealth owned by people that inherited it, right? And it's significant, right? So it's like, I don't even remember the statistic, but um, there was a, there was a, I think a school in Chesterfield last year or the year before got in a whole lot of trouble for showing this little video, this little video, I think it was an animated thing, right? Of like, what was, oh, yeah, and, uh, and right there, sorry. Um, but it was basically showing like, it's like a foot race, right? Um, and white people running from the beginning, right? And they're way ahead. And then like 1964, brown and black people got to start running. Um, and so, you know, part of my job is to enforce the Fair Housing Act, right? And so there's part of, part of that is like, make sure people aren't being discriminated against and, and enforce that. The other part is to be affirmative. And so that's the part that like, all we, we are all, I think in this room on the same page that where we are right now was intentionally designed um, by primarily dudes that look like me, right? Um, we have to be as intentional undoing that as it was created. Um, and so that means wealth opportunity, 
that means not being afraid of, of what's going to happen if some privilege disappears or goes away. Um, and you know, and, and, and you know, for for me personally, like being painfully cognizant of that at all times um, until it become until it becomes second nature, right? Hopefully. Um, and then the I think the other thing is being a good neighbor. Right? I say this, um, people, I, I lecture and, and stuff, and people are always like, well, what can we do? Um, and that, you know, varies on, on the person, but all of us can be a good neighbor. Um, and I don't know what that means, because I'm sure I haven't been a great neighbor at times, right? Um, but I also know that the best neighbors I ever had lived in Brooklyn Park. Um, you know, I, I moved, my wife and I moved onto Garland Avenue in 2005, kind of diagonal across from the first uh, black woman that moved onto, onto Garland in the 50s. Um, her son and his family lived right across the street. Um, I mean, you know, it was, it was a real community of neighbors. And, you know, as mommy across the street, you know, her dementia got worse and worse, she would, she would get out and there, you know, there are many, many times I'm running down the street after this 80 year old woman in a bathrobe, like getting her back home and making sure she's safe and like caring for your neighbors, um, regardless of class or race. Um, is, I think, really, really critical, especially in uh, today where we are super hyper-partisan and there's a, just a lot of angst. Um, so that's, that's one thing I, I always tell people. It's just, it's, it's easy and, and free, right? Um, I think Brian brings up an interesting point about privilege, and so from our perspective as white guys, I think we have to approach this, you know, differently. And I think there's there's two ways to go about coming up with solutions, right? There are top-down solutions, and then there are bottom-up solutions. And I think what I have learned is that as a white guy, I can use my privilege to hopefully fight for solutions from the top down that affirmatively advance the equity that Brian was talking about. One example is, in getting back to this whole discussion about what does affordable housing mean, well, in order to, to really reach the level of affordability where that need is, in Richmond at least, which Shekinah was alluding to, the 30 to 50 percent and lower, um, you know, home ownership is really tough at that level. There are, there are ways to do it, there are, you know, ways for a, a shared equity models to reach that low, and there, there are innovations that we can advance, but really rental is the name of the game at that point. But rental housing in the city is very hard to develop just in general in some cases, especially if you want to make it affordable. Doing rental multifamily housing is illegal because of zoning in wide swaths of the city. And so if we want to have discussions about creating housing that is affordable through whatever mechanisms are available to us at that deep level, we have to think about top-down solutions to change our land use and zoning regulations that you know were really put into place decades ago to cement the redlining and the exclusion that was happening in the first half of the, the 20th century when zoning really came into being. So there's ways, I hope, for people like Brian and myself to use our privilege in ways like that. And I think the other side of that coin is taking our privilege and helping bottom-up solutions get fostered and created by just moving out of the way sometimes, um, or a lot of the times, and really allowing communities to come up with innovative solutions on their own, like Art was talking about, to creating a house that is, you know, by its design and by its placement can be super affordable and is something that, you know, a community can buy into. And so I think those are the two ways, at least, you know, white people like me can, you know, be 
begin to um, undo some of the things that gentrification is doing and move in a positive direction. Um, but I'm still learning, so we'll see. Oh, don't pass the mic just yet. Um, tell the people a little bit about the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. Those who might not be aware of that. Sure. So uh, the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust is the second community land trust in the state of Virginia. The first one was in Charlottesville, the Thomas Jefferson Community Land Trust. Um, there are hundreds of community land trusts across the country. Community land trusts are a, um, a unique model of home ownership where uh, the nonprofit, the community land trust, the CLT, um, purchases a, in this case, a, a piece of vacant land. Um, it will develop a house or have a house built on that land in one way or another. And then when it comes, comes time to sell that house, the buyer purchases only the house itself and the land stays with the land trust. Um, that reduces the price of the house. Again, we can also put in additional subsidy to, depending on what the market is saying and what affordability level we're trying to reach um, and who needs to be served, we can, we can hit a certain price point. But by removing the land from the transaction and keeping it within the trust, which is controlled by community members and community stakeholders um, in perpetuity, um, that allows the home to remain perpetually affordable for generations because when it comes time for that first homeowner to sell their home um, in five years, 10, 50, however long they might want to live there, um, the, le the appreciation that accrues in that property, which can be a lot in areas like Church Hill that are gentrifying and experiencing huge increases in property value, that appreciation is shared between the homeowner, so they get some return back, and the other parts of it, depending on the, the ratio that's set, the other parts of that appreciation stay with the home, stay inside the CLT to lower the sales price for the next buyer. So it's a way of securing below market rate um, uh, housing prices for home ownership for a community for as long as the CLT is around, you know, for in perpetuity. Um, it's not a silver bullet by any means, but it's just a tool that we uh, need to, to have in our toolbox to create um, wealth building opportunities. And I think um, the Maggie Walker CLT is really positioned as a, as a stepping stone, hopefully, for folks to get into a house in a rapidly um, appreciating area in a neighborhood that they might have grown up in that have no other way to afford a home there because the housing prices are increasing rapidly. But it gets, it gets them a foot in the door and it allows them to potentially buy their own home and their own piece of land outside of the CLT model at you know some point down the road. Or they can stay in the CLT house for the rest of their life. We're happy either way. Um, but it's a way to put land into community control and create perpetual affordability for generations. Yeah, thank you. So I, I got a news flash for you guys. Um, black people don't need white people to do anything for them in this city other than give them an opportunity to get to resources. Um, we have enough human resources and intellectual capital to do pretty much what we want to do, okay? But we just need the opportunity and we need someone to be intentional about giving us the opportunity. If we come to you and we ask you for your help, it's not because you're white. It's because you have some creative or intellectual capital that we need to further the plan. And if we need, if, and if we need for you to use your white privilege, we'll give you the piece of paper and say, please use your white privilege and go in here and get this for us. Okay? I mean, I mean, it's really, yeah, that's what we do, we do, we do Go get us this. So that's what we do. And so, you know, <laughs> I mean, so I, um, I'm, I'm going to just dedicate this last little piece to my sister Lily ASD's. Um, Three o'clock. Actually, my friend Jake woke me up. He's in a band. He was coming back. He woke me up. He said he had some pizza, and I said, I woke up. I said, you know what, Jake? I think Lily has finally drove me crazy. I said, did I actually 
uh, walk across the state capitol carrying a cardboard coffin singing, We Shall Overcome. <laughs> and he said, yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> he said, yeah, you did. I said, okay, I think I've done enough. Um, but I was in a dentist that was an old black lady. She was talking about living in a Temple Brother house. I don't know, this is probably old Temple Brother who was a renter, and black people lived in his homes, and they were substandard and horrible homes. And she talked about how she would use newspaper to put between the walls to keep the air coming from in. And she talked about how every morning in the winter she would have to get a court, court can to walk to get oil to keep her house warm. And then she said public housing came. She said, I, I could, I had walls. They were concrete, but there was no air coming in. She said, for the first time in my life, I could turn the thermostat and get some heat. She said, for me, public housing was the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. Y'all have heard us use all these words, have all these conversations, gentrification, racism, affordable housing, poverty, intentional bias. And I, was, I would strongly urge you guys not to wear any of our old stuff, because that's our old stuff. This is no longer uh, a black and white world, okay? As much as we want to cling to it. I mean, the last time I used my pimp game, I was on the university. And um, I, walked up, I walked up to this, this sister. She was so beautiful. And I said, you know what? Us black people, we got to stick together. And she looked at me, she said, what are you talking about? She said, we don't talk like that no more. She says, I'm Mexican, Asian, and African. I said, oh, OK. <laughs> You know, we are past the place where we can look at people by the color of their skin and say who they are anymore, you know. Um, we have the ability, we have the intellectual, we have the resources. I, what I love about this city is I know that this is a city that does anything it wants to do. We always have, we can do, and we've always done anything we want to do, and whatever we're not doing is simply because we just don't want to do it, okay? And that's just the reality of our city. We can build the next generation of public housing, not because people are poor, not because they are broken, not because their streets are dirty, not because they're violent, but simply because we want to do the next great thing. Um, Dave, can I take a couple questions from the audience? We got some time for that. And we, we, and we are very intentional about these large housing development efforts that require people to build 250 homes at a time, but black people have always built homes one at a time. And they've always helped each other build homes. And they build a home, and then they build a home, and they build a home, and they have a community. And so we really have to get back to where we give black people and black contractors and black developers the opportunities to build their own communities. Um, 
if, if when you look at the work of Maggie Walker, you know, it started with small saving plans and cooperatives and uh, uh, we're building that effort now with the Food Justice Corridor in the East End uh, and it's modeled after some work called uh, Align Tennessee where everybody comes together and is really intentional about solving a problem. And so um, that would be one. And then, of course, yeah, I think as African-American people, you, you know, as controversial as it is, I think you have to look at some of the work that the Nation of Islam has done and is doing across the country as models of work. And then um, Duran can talk about some of the stuff that's being done on the food justice corridor side that ties into land and uh, uh, reparations around giving land. Uh, I'm going to throw this in there. Uh, in terms of the food justice conversation, uh, there's a book by uh, Jessica Danhar called Collective Courage about uh, uh, African American Cooperative Economic Development. And then Richmond is in the index of the book. Right? <laughs> How about that? The Red Circle Cooperative in Richmond, Virginia, uh, in the 60s, built a cooperative grocery store in Jackson for as a uh, solution to the lack of uh, ability to go to the uh, grocery across the street, right? They pulled their money, put it together, and made healthy food available for the black community in Jackson Ward. And I think it's just amazing that as we have these conversations around food access and food justice in the context of, you know, redlining, displacement, you know, about the historical precedent of the Red Circle Cooperative from 1960, right here in Jackson Court. And I just want to put that in the um, Thoughts, again, I'm trying to make sure that everyone has a chance to chime in and get us a hand on. I'd like to uh, say I've been a part of this gentrification issue since October of last year. And Moved everything from Hood, City of Richmond, uh, Project Home, whatever item um, that were given to me as far as resources to go get into to see what I had done to take care of the issue. Twice a week, I get two postcards with a picture of the house telling me that it looks vacant, do I want to sell it? Three times a week, I get phone calls, phone calls, same time every day, person going to buy the house. I've gone down to City Hall, asked for information. The people in City Hall really can't refer me to anyone as far as resources to check into. The city's website still has quite generous picture there for the day. <laughs> Representative from the property inspection office, the only thing that saved me at this point is bad luck. You know. So I'm up against either I get the repairs done that the city says I need to have fixed, which I've been told would not have been cited in the first place had it not been for some of the people that are trying to buy properties in the neighborhood. Do I sell my house and then try to live the rest of my years off what little I'm going to get? You know, I purchased the home in 1987 for $35,800. Chamber mm. City in this loan, never refinanced it. I paid the mortgage off two years ago. Mm. Because I think that speaks to the to the title of, uh, of today's conversation. No, I'm saying I'm going to talk. Okay. This is Laura Lafayette. Uh, Laura is uh, involved in a great many uh, uh, 
affordable housing efforts in the city. So y'all make sure y'all on that. Um, and make sure that before we leave, we get your information, we can figure out what some strategies um, that folks can uh, circle around you. Because I know what you're talking about, right? Um, my, the house that I live in currently was under that same search of circumstances. It was like this close to being foreclosed, right? Um, so it would, if it wasn't for me and my fiance like saying, okay, well, we're going to step in and take over, you know, the mortgage, the house would have been foreclosed on, bank would have got it, and then, you know, it would have been the next redone house on North Avenue, right? So it is a community response that's often necessary, you know, to keep people in place and keep homes within the family, keep homes within you know, that context. But we know that the reality is a lot of the homes in Bronx City that were built in the 50s, they need some rehab, right? My, like I said, my house has oil heat, right? So from November to March, I'm $300 a month, right? And that's some hard decisions. <laughs> like, am I going to buy XYZ or am I going to pay this heat bill and so something might be late, right? And I think a lot of families in the city experience the same thing, that houses are not weatherproofed, you know, the so windows need to be redone, the roof might need to be redone, you know, the, uh, there is no central AC or heat in the home. So, you know, we got to figure out strategies that we can help with just the everyday decisions that homeowners are having to make, right, in order to keep them in their home so that they can pay the taxes, you know, on it, or, you know, they can fight back on these developers that are trying to take the home away from them. Any other questions, thoughts, feedback? We've got some people here. Hey, this is an ideological question. It's for this gentleman right here. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Right here, like, yeah. Um, I, I'm just interested in the ideology. You mentioned Battery Park and how, you know, a lot of the white people started moving back in, and they have one idea of how a neighborhood should be, but the black folk that have been there for a while have a different one. Can you explain the difference to me? It's really interesting. Most of the community, communities that a lot of these white residents came from are 90% white, meaning that most of them have never lived around black people. So they have a concept of what they think community is from what they've grown up with. And when they come into our communities, it's a, it's a culture shock because they're not used to seeing uh, the levels of denigration that a lot of these communities are being forced to deal with because we don't have the resources. Um, I think the problem, the biggest issue in the city and the biggest impediment to the city is the education system. Plain and simple, and I'm an RPS graduate, um, but our school system is failing <coughs> miserably. I worry about Northside and Brooklyn Park a lot because we're talking about homes that Less than 10 years ago, a, a newly renovated house in Northside could probably run you 120, 150,000. Now we're looking at homes now that you won't get under 300. They're over four, they're pushing for five now. Um, and at one time, the only homes that, that cost that much were in Get Park. Now they're all over Northside. So I'm living in a home that cost me 120,000. But you just put a home next to me now that's four hundred fifty thousand dollars. So what's going to happen to me? Now, when we have these millennials moving in, and when they have children, and our elementary schools are very good, I will say that the elementary schools and rich schools are good. But when they get to the middle school level, that's when the flight takes. That's when they need. So what's going to happen when they decide to leave again, and we have these three four hundred thousand dollars shells? just sit there, that no one is going to be able to just pick them up and run into them and live in them like they are now. So our education system starts one. That's the main thing. Also, a lot of these advocacy, these programs that are out here, HUD, Better Housing Coalition, I mean, they're good, but they're not good enough. There are a lot of grassroots efforts in the city going on that a lot of us are involved in, and that's where you really have to look at. I've been studying programs in other cities, in Seattle, 
you know, that has an advocacy program that is really, really doing great things in affordable housing. So we're looking at other cities and seeing what they're doing that's being successful that we can implement here in the city. Because, I mean, these organizations have been here for years and people are still starving. So some changes have to come. Um, two things I'd like to add to the ideology part is that um, a lot of times when, when, when white folks come around black folk and look at the problems the assumption is that there are problems because black people simply don't want to do anything about it, okay? Um, when the reality of it is black people simply cannot afford in a lot of cases to do anything about it. So when you come into the room, as opposed to saying what you think needs to be done, maybe you could start having the conversation with people of color about what they have been trying to do and see how you can support that effort. Um, Southern Garden Heights is the challenges that that was a black middle class community made up of largely professional teachers and they, there was white flight and then there was black flight of the middle class. And so in most white communities, you have prof a professional class of people that most black communities now, particularly in the city, don't have. They just all are gone. I mean, if you want to build a house, you can find a carpenter, plumber, electrician, you're good. But if you're looking for a teacher, a businessman, an accountant, then you start, you're going to start to have problems. And so some of it is about return of intellectual capital to black communities so they have the resources to be able to help figure out how to solve their problems. They know what they want to do. They just need the intellectual capital and, and the resources. And so, but I, I would, that is, so I, uh, those are some of just uh, my observations and suggestions that I would make. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to the orchestrators and the participants of this event. at BCU. I'm from Newport News, Virginia. Before coming here, I've had conversations for months about gentrification, and I've had extreme difficulty understanding what this actually is before tonight. So thank you guys for real. Um, my question is, what does this look like from the standpoint of someone who's in a home who's, who's uh, becoming a victim of this? Because I simply lack the experiential part of that because I've never owned a home on Main Team. But what does that look like? You know, like, how does that start? Does it start with the phone calls? And like, what does that mean? And why are they forced? What does that force look like? So I'll just jump in and I'll pass it to Dan. Um, the first thing that it looks like is, uh, okay, when someone purchases a home in a neighborhood, right, uh, the value of that home, there's a, there's a website, there's, some, there's an assessor's value to that home, right? So somebody comes in and purchases that home above the assessed value, right? That raises the value of the homes in that general area, right? So multiply that times not one, not two, but times 10, times 20, right? When those homes are starting to be purchased above the assessed value price, then everyone that's, that was living in that neighborhood prior now has to pay higher taxes, right, on their home, right? And so what that does is it could be a slow shift, right? You know, maybe it's a hundred dollars extra a year, right? But in some cases it's like from two hundred to maybe sixteen hundred dollars in taxes in a year, right? So that's a drastic shift. And so if you as a homeowner become delinquent on your taxes, right, then you are had uh, threat of losing your home. Right? So once you become delinquent on your taxes, then the house becomes tax delinquent, then the child's house can be taken from you, and then now you are displaced. Right? That's the homeowner side. From a renter's side, right? as a renter of a home inside of a community that's rapidly transitioning, your rent might be $650 one year, right? but as the, hop, the, the neighborhood becomes a hotter commodity, that next year it might be $700, next year after that might be $750, then the home that the home, the person that owns the property that you're renting might sell said home 
and then now says, okay, I'm not renting next year, I'm gonna upgrade the entire house and now I'm charging 1,050 for the house, right? So then that means that you as a renter are now displaced from the area in which you live. So, you know, it's a whole thing. It's also about, you know, the development of uh, commercial properties in the area. So, you know, in Churchill, we're looking at what's happening with Market at 25th and a development around that area. Uh, we know that the property values are gonna raise up because once a grocery store comes into a neighborhood and other commercial developments happen, that means that the taxes and the assessed value of those homes in the area are gonna rise up as well. So these are like the market factors. And, I'm going to stop there and let some of my other folks that maybe can allude to some more of the elements to this better than I can. Sure. So yeah, just anecdotally, two things come to mind. Um, remember a couple years back, barefoot running was this thing, like people were running barefoot. Um, I was lived on. I was living on Garland, and I saw a white guy running down my street barefoot. And I knew at that moment that that neighborhood was gentrifying. <laughs> right? Like that was the tell, right? <clears throat> I was also about a year after that at work doing something, and I was like, sometimes I'll be like, have to get on Google Maps and like I'll be looking at whatever, trying to find a property or whatever. And Google Maps like captures. You know, it's just a car. I actually was out, I got off of Google Maps out in front of my house waving at the thing. But anyways, um, which for me was like, I've reached it, like. Um, <laughs> but it, I, was, I was like looking up in Church Hill and I, you know, like there were these three young white guys walking down the center of the street um, in a neighborhood where that was out of place, right? And I was like, that's, what it looks like, but as a neighbor, right, that has kind of lived in, in gentrifying areas, um, I've seen it as people passing away, right, in older neighborhoods because, you know, Brooklyn Park was, and still is, an older, older neighborhood, right? So, attended uh, more funerals than I would have liked to of neighbors. Um, seen it as job loss um, and I've seen it as people moving to the counties for schools right so there's a lot of a lot of forces at, at play um, so it's yeah it, it's just a complicated thing of what, it, of what it looks like but if you see on a <laughs> Just really quickly, I'll add, so, um, uh, by, so the, one of the favorite stories I talked about was my parents buying the house, right? Um, for them, while this is a complex, nuanced issue, the value that their house has been increasing is a wonderful, wonderful thing, right? So they say to me, Shekinah, basically, you're not gonna have to take care of us when it's time for us to retire because we're gonna tap into the equity in our home. Right, and that's that's one thing to, just a side note, we have seen income, um, we've been closing the gap in terms of income inequality, but it's the wealth gap that's the big thing. Like for black folks, it's $17,000, for white folks, it's 271. And two thirds of that is property ownership. And so being able to have um, financial resiliency, so that if I do lose my job or something happens, I can tap into some cash or some equity is important. So for my parents, who well, again bought this affordable home years and years and years ago, um, having that equity is building wealth for them because they're homeowners, right? If you are a senior on fixed income and you can't pay your taxes, you are in jeopardy of losing your home. For me and Demetrius, we don't own a home yet, we're renters. So for us, it looked like having five different addresses in four years because the rent kept going up and the amount we could afford in terms of square footage kept going down. It also meant, um, honestly, there were times in the process that it, um, we felt robbed of our dignity. So I'll give you an example. Um, we're going to, we were staying in a house and they decided, you know what, the property is going up. We, we need y'all to move out in the next 30 to 60 days because we want to sell the house. 
right? And like moving is expensive, so you gotta have enough for the deposit. You hoping that the house is in good shape, you can get your deposit back. Sometimes it doesn't happen. But so we're looking in other places and um, you have to set multiple appointments because people don't show up. Um, we've been, we went to multiple places that literally had garbage in the house. Um, we had folks say to us, this is right on that borderline, so if y'all, you know, this is a good time to get into this house because if you can rent from here, um, the other side, this is not the dangerous side of the neighborhood, right? And I'm thinking, like, this is where I'm from. What do you mean? Like, what are you saying? And I've had, I had to say to people, would you live here? Like, would you live here based on what you're showing? But we haven't talked about capitalism, and that's just the general laws of supply and demand and greed and this basic human need that we all have for home and for shelter is attached to this like wealth building capitalism system. Um, and so it means that you have experiences like that. And my husband was like, why don't we just move somewhere else? I was like, ain't nobody finna tell me that I can't stay in the neighborhood that I've grown up in and that I know and I love. But that's that's what it feels like. So uh, thank you for sharing this, you kind of, I appreciate it. <laughs> So, um, Richmond versus everybody. Um, I'd like to thank all of you all for coming out tonight. Give yourselves a round of applause for being here. And continue that round of applause for all my co-panelists. So from here, you know, um, I, saw, I was on Instagram and somebody was like, yeah, why should I come this? I said, he ain't never been in that. And like, I do it, you know, I had to encourage them. Um, I'm leaving you with some homework, all right? Uh, first off, um, I need you to Google home, housing opportunities made equal. I need you to Google the Maggie Walker Community Land Trust. I need you to Google the Richmond Food Justice Corridor. I need you to Google the Brooklyn Park Area Association and the uh, Ascend. Oh. The Historic Brooklyn Park Collective. Historic Black Brooklyn Park Collective. And, uh, you know, she kind of, should I say, Virginia List? Um, I need you to look up these organizations that are doing work to address these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's imperative for you as, you know, community to plug into these organizations, find ways to support the work that they're doing, um, connect with them on an intrinsic level, right? It's not just about like a transaction, it's like these organizations need people power to push it forward. Uh, they need funding, they need ideas, they need ambassadors. So if you have time and energy and are passionate about this topic, you have been introduced to five organizers and organizations that are dedicated to addressing these issues uh, that have been so eloquently uh, discussed today. Um, lastly, you know, make sure you follow all of the uh, social media for uh, Beautiful RBA, which is at everything Beautiful RBA, and Deron Shavers. Um, I'm not gonna hold y'all up anymore. I know we're supposed to get out of here tonight. Uh, shout out to Rashid Johnson and Monument and the Institute for Contemporary Art here at BCU for allowing us to have this amazing event here today. Thank you, David. And y'all make sure y'all take a lot of Instagram photos. Shout out. Peace. See y'all later.